Gig Gab, episode 393 for Monday, August 14th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Today in Capitola, California, it's Paul Kent. How are we today, Mr. Paul Kent? Well, I'll tell you, like our our very existence doing this show is a is a colliding of our worlds, right? Like two Apple guys who are also music guys, but rarely do we get the pleasure and privilege of extending that out beyond our little bubble, right? Right. So today it's kind of fun. We're actually colliding worlds of music and Apple industry out to the developer world with somebody who's actually done essential work to make all of our lives a little bit better. So this is pretty cool. Yeah, it, it's true. We'd like to welcome Chris Lissio from Super Mega Ultra Groovy, the makers of Capo. You've heard me talk about that, but now we actually have Chris here. Chris, thank you for joining us today. It's no problem at all. I'm so happy to, to join in and Dab about gigs. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, yeah. We always tell people when they come on the show. Uh, you know, I, I we've had folks that are like, "Oh, my stories are boring. Nobody wants to hear my stories about like music or like the nerdy stuff." I'm like, "Yeah, no, no, no. This is where that stuff is actually interesting. The things that put people to sleep at cocktail parties are really, really exciting to a certain subset of the population, and we we are here. So yeah, it's great to have you. Yeah." And I got the first question. Go. Go for it. How on earth did you name your company? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> so I was 19. <laughs> it, the year was 1999. So that does put an age on me. And I was at the University of Waterloo. And um, I was working on my first shareware software package for BOS, of all things. Wow. And... Um, I needed a company to, you know, legally sell something. And I'm a big fan of The Simpsons. And I don't know if you remember the episode where they go to Japan and they're on a game show with a really wacky name with like a bunch of, you know, adjectives smashed together. And I thought, hmm. I started coming up with ideas (laughs) and it's sort of a backronym, right? Smug, super mega ultra groovy. Ah. And it stuck. So it's it's a really old domain name. Wow. Very clever. Oh, oh it all makes sense now. I it never makes sense. I never saw the smug thing in there, but I like that. That's good. Yeah. Backronym. That's good. Yeah. And actually, if we're really going to connect the dots here, like smug is Stanford Macintosh users group. So just, just saying <laughs> we're really going to get, get, get geeky here. Wow. So. Nice, yeah. Nice connection, Paul. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So I, obviously you're a programmer. We've talked about Capo and I, I want to talk more about it as we kind of progress through here, but I, I'm, I'm curious, like clearly you're a musician, uh, that, like th- I I'm assuming that you're a musician and you built this to at least initially scratch an itch. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's really weird. I don't think I self identified as a musician until probably recently, um, which is, which is so silly now that I know what I know. Um, I mean, I've, I've played music, um, for myself mostly, uh, since I was a kid, like I growing up, I think I got like a little toy, you know, Casio keyboard as a gift, probably when I was like seven or eight years old or something along those lines. And I've just always sort of fooled around on it. I never really had lessons or anything like that. And I guess I started picking things up, you know, by ear because what else are you going to do when you're playing with your keyboard and you don't have music and you don't know how to read music and you just noodle around. Um, So that's kind of the seed of it. Um, Did you ever, did you ever wind up taking lessons or anything? So I, I have recollection of like, one maybe two lessons at the local community center but it wasn't for me so they sort of sat me down at whatever age i was and you know sort of put a twinkle twinkle little star in front of me and i'm like no thanks that's not for me sure um so it was more of a traditional you know piano um thing and i guess the next brush i had with formal music instruction was 
Uh, when I was in grade seven in elementary school, I was fortunate to have an elementary school that had a like a full band. Oh, um, wow. So you were able to opt in to take band class. And when we were trying out for instruments, we sort of, you know, try out the French horn, try out the trombone, try out, you know, all these different things and see what you sort of jive with. And this is in first grade? No, seventh grade. Seventh grade. Seventh Sorry. Grade. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. I, I, I missed that. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And Even still, that's quite early. That would have been awesome in first grade. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, did, did you, but wait, did you say elementary school or did you say middle school? I did say elementary school. Yeah. So seventh um, grade in Canada. So we have some middle schools and we have, uh, I don't know, I guess you would call them K to eight. Um, okay. so kindergarten all the way up to grade eight yeah, in the same sure. building. Yeah. It all makes sense. Now, yeah. now I, now my, uh, yes, I, I at least have an excuse for my confusion or at least I'm going to call that to my excuse. It's it, I have no so, excuse. So we should pause for a second. You should finish your thought there, Chris, but yep. we're going on the assumption that everybody in the world, even though we've been praising it for years now, everybody knows what capo is. Let's just kind of take a second here sure. and give us the one paragraph of this amazing tool that you've developed. What is it? And what does it do? And then we'll get to why you did it and who it helps and where it's going, all that stuff. But for right now, for the greater universe, uh, sure. besides Dave and I, what's your one paragraph? You know, I struggle with it all the time. Um, capo is many things to many different musicians, but the way I sort of wrap it up for the cocktail parties to follow the theme is um, I write software targeted at musicians that learn by ear. And um, how that happens, you know, can dictate which subset of the features that you use. If you're sort of new to it or uncomfortable to the idea of maybe picking out chords yourself, you're going to really lean heavily on the automatic chord rec recognition that's built in. But if, you, um, if you're at a point where maybe you don't need that slash, maybe you're looking for the challenge, you might, you know, turn that display off or you play the drums or you play more, you know, solo -y type stuff, that's a corner of the app you're not going to spend too much time in. The people who are sort of in the middle to advanced area might turn to more the, the what I call the advanced playback functionalities, which are the slowing down without affecting pitch, the ability to um, you know, transpose a recording, the, um, and even the fine tuning ability, the ability to take like an older recording and shift it by, you know, just a little bit to, to sort of account for those old tape transfers that kind of have a little bit of trouble there. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's really hard to give that, <laughs> that, you know, elevator pitch because as a developer, you kind of want to start going down that path of, you know, oh, it's got chord detection. It's got automatic beat recognition and you can edit the beat grid and you could do all this stuff. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait a second. <laughs> take a, take a step back. No, I, you know, I think, I, I mean, as you were explaining your entry into playing music and the fact that you learned by ear and, and clearly have a preference for learning by ear, it all started to make sense. It was like, oh, you built an app for people who want to learn by ear. And yes, there are many different ways to approach that depending on what you play and how you play it. But yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's your cocktail party pitch. It's an app for people who want to learn music by ear. Yeah. 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 And just all the features and the way it's grown over time. I and mean, I found it when it was a, a, a slow downer tool. Right. And the question yeah. I would if I would have met you face to face back then, the question I would have asked is what guitar solo was making you crazy that you decided to write this awesome software for? Um. It didn't really happen like that because, I mean, as you both are well aware, this this category of app is, I didn't create it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. The ability to slow down without affecting pitch was some, something that sort of, I mean, I distinctly remember, I want to say Sound on Sound magazines or something like that that I would read in high school where I remember the first ads came out and they were talking about breaking the laws of physics because now you can adjust the speed of sound without messing with the pitch. And so that technology has been there for a long time. So the way that I came into it is now fast forward a long time. <laughs> so I was about, geez, I, I was well into adulthood. I had already sort of gone indie as a developer. Um, I had other software that I was working on full time. 
And to sort of pick up a hobby, uh, since I was a full-time software developer, so my, my indie software thing was no longer a side gig. So I wanted, I had time now to, to pick up a hobby. So now I could finally learn guitar like I've been meaning to want to do for many years. Mm. And um, I mean, turns out that this was about 15 years ago that I, uh, you know, set out to the guitar store, picked up a guitar, signed up, or actually I didn't sign up for lessons. I decided I'm going to use these resources on YouTube because there's so many people out there on the internet who will help me learn the guitar. Um, did a bunch of that for, I want to say a year. And then I started taking real lessons. And I want to say like my first lesson, my guitar teacher asked me, Hey, you know, one of the things I want you to do is I want you to grab one of these songs that we talked about and try to figure it out by ear. Just kind of hack it out and, <laughs> and go for it. Little thought, did he okay. know. Yeah. <laughs> Little did he know he, well, he set me out with this task and I was like, okay, um, I can kind of hack it out. And, and then I used, I, I found, you know, one of the, the sort of established players in the market. And I was like, man, this is awful. <laughs> like it, the software did all the stuff I needed to do, but it's very clearly a cross-platform app. It's not the kind of software I want to be using on a regular basis. I just, I don't enjoy myself in it. At the time, I had already won an Apple Design Award from one of my past pieces of software. So I'm coming at this thinking, maybe I can come into this area and bring a little bit of the, um, to, to, to use a, a term coined by Brent Simmons, a mac assed Mac app. <laughs> Um, version of this that is, you know, unapologetically very Mac-like, very yep. cleanly designed and um, all the keystrokes make sense on the Mac, you know, nothing that seems out of place. And um, that's kind of what started it more than any particular solo or any challenge or anything like that. It's, it's so strange how that is. But um, yeah, there's definitely solos that have come since the software started that I was able to start totally tackling way better than I ever thought I could have done. Got it. Well, that, that's what got me started with the tool is like just deconstructing, giving me a practice tool, giving me a learning tool, a listening tool. So helpful. So kudos to you, Chris, you've really done guitar players around the world, you know, a great service. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm still blown away by the variety of instruments. Um, that people play when they reach out to me, you know, I had one guy years ago who said, Oh yeah, I play the, I think it's the Irish bazooki or something like that. It's some kind of, you know, stringed instrument, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> people with hammered dulcimers that are into it and harmonica players. And obviously you got your horn players, your drummers, all kinds, including a very famous one who <laughs> reached out to me just randomly on the phone and just blew my mind. Um, because if I completed my thought from being an elementary school band, the instrument I took to was the drums. <laughs> so my, my yeah. first, you know, properly taught instrument was drums. So I had always sort of had a connection to the drums. So when I get a phone call from Dennis Chambers, of all people, <laughs> saying, <laughs> hey, why isn't Capo on the iPhone yet? Um, you, you kind of pay attention. <laughs> that's, that's inspiring. Yes. That's yeah. great. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. It turns out a friend of a friend sort of has a connection to him. And sure. uh, I guess Dennis had been at the time, you know, very frustrated that, you know, he didn't have looping abilities and stuff within the music app and, and all that. And so this friend of a friend said, Hey, actually, I, I know of a guy who works on this app called Capo. It's, it's on the Mac and you should give him a ring. <laughs> It's not just Dennis Chambers, right? I mean, your website's got a list of people oh, yeah. whose names we know, like Will Lee and Vernon Reed and Jordan Rudis. Like, like it's, it's, I mean, it's not surprising that people who play music f as their life, I, yes, for a living, but also just as their life, it's not surprising that they also would find great utility in a tool like this, just like the rest of us. Uh, yeah. So... That is a whole other wacky story of, of how all those sort of came to be. Do and tell if you can. Yeah. So I was very, very fortunate to, to get an opportunity to work with somebody who had uh, previously done um, 
uh, I want to say artist outreach and um, training to a large degree of professionals, uh, teaching them Logic Pro. Okay. And so um, working with her, um, she, had, she had basically spent tons of time with people who uh, are in the pro music world and do a lot of work with Logic. And when they want to learn tips, tricks, or they get stuck, she was the person who was sort of their liaison to, um, you know, get their feedback back to, well, it was eMagic originally, but then later Apple. And um, also just sort of give them a heads up on new features or, you know, functionality and stuff like that. So that was already just an amazing uh, person to get connected with. And in our initial phone calls, I was sort of telling her like, like I didn't know about these connections at the time when I first started talking to her. And I said, you know, I have sort of a weird idea, which is I have no, no chance of, you know, finding like a, a Steve Vai or a John Mayer or a, you know, pick your top guitarist or drummer or keyboard player or whatever. I was saying, you know, this is an app really that I think is great for session musicians or, you know, working musicians, people who are, you know, propping those big names up in, in, in some respects. Fair. Uh, yeah. No, it's it's a great app skills. for, for someone who needs to learn things quickly and then go play them. You know, it, it like, it's great for hobbyists too, but where I find I use it the most is, oh crap, I need to learn this song by Friday for a gig yep. and I need to dive in, figure out which sections I know and I don't need to worry about because I don't have enough time to really spend equal time on the whole song. Like, let me find the problem spots and now I'm just going to woodshed those. And that that's really one of the places where Capo is uh, like, is invaluable to me. So makes perfect sense that yes, session musicians, that is their life is exactly that. Yeah. Right. And in that initial conversation, you know, she thought, Oh, I thought you were going to, you know, try to get me to, you know, work my connections and maybe just get you in front of some of those big names. But she's like, if, if those are the people that you're interested in talking to, I know tons of those people. <laughs> so, you know, let's start reaching out to them and see what they think of the app. Well, what started to happen in many cases was she would reach out to them and say, hey, you know, um, I'm working with, with a company that, that develops this app called Capo that does this slowing stuff. And one of them that comes to mind is Will Lee, the bassist. He's like, oh, Capo, I've been using that forever. That's a fantastic <laughs> app. That's awesome. <laughs> so so there, were, there were like a good number of, of people who are on that list who were already using it before we had sort of reached out to sort of give them a look at the app and what it can do. Um, and the folks that hadn't heard of it were just very receptive to what it could do. And I mean, some folks just went over and above with how they were willing to, to help us out in terms of, you know, sharing their experiences and, you know, in some cases making videos for us, which I'm still, that's awesome. I still can't believe a lot of that stuff happened. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's great that it's happened. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of really proud of that list and I, and I, uh, I try not to lean on it too much because at the end of the day, I, the app does have to, to sell itself, you know? Um, yeah, but it, you app. could, you could <laughs> lean on it more like, like, you, you know, you, you would send us uh, just so it, it, a little bit of the nuts and bolts of this. Obviously we've, we've been doing this campaign sure. with you for a long time. It wasn't until, uh, I started researching for this episode, this conversation that we're having that I even knew of Will Lee or Dennis Chambers or, you know, Vernon Reed or any of those folks that would have been something to include in, in the ad reads. Like I would say maybe lean on that a little more than you do. It is noble of you that you, it, especially in the development of the app, you prioritize actually making an app that people want to use. However, it is okay to name drop when beat appropriate. Yeah. Beat your chest a little bit. It's okay. Well, yeah. 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 I wish We're I had seen this earlier. Cause I would have integrated it into more of the ad reads. I would have been like, yeah. And if, if, you know, if you like what Will Lee does, well, he uses this app and Dennis Chambers uses it like that. that, that a little bit of that is okay. 
It's okay. For sure. And there's also a message that no matter no matter what your skill level is, like you're saying, you starting as a as a you know just learning by your musician to incredibly experienced musicians, the tool provides service and value and utility for all different levels of musicians. And it, it, yeah, beat your chest, man. That's the Canadian in me, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, it, it's better than the alternative. Don't get me wrong. Like, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's such a weird thing about me. And, um, yeah, d- definitely. I mean, you're right. I, I should pull that out more. But at the same time, it's like I, I see it done a little too much by other people as well. Of so course. Yes. You know, you get a little skeezed out and you just feel like a little slimy. <laughs> well, you know, sleeping at night is a beautiful thing, but there's, there's gray exactly. in between, right? I mean, there's, yeah. there, it's not, it's not binary. Absolutely. Yeah. Our, and, um, our friend Mark yeah. Altacruz is also on, uh, oh, yeah? <laughs> Chris's page here, Paul. So I, 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 I like that too. So yeah. Yeah. Mark, like I said, worlds collide here. This is, and then all the people that you mentioned, I think, including Will Lee. We're Macworld Expo attendees at one point. Oh, that's right. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. All right. Well, summer is still rocking and rolling here, but fall is just around the corner. And with that, I think we're all looking for wholesome, convenient meals for those jam-packed days. And this is where our sponsor, Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help us fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to our doors. I love Factor. Lisa and I have used it quite a bit throughout the summer. I know we're going to be using it in the fall. We're about to have our kitchen redone. Factor is going to be a huge factor in that because these meals are delicious, right? We can get the factor meals. We can put them in our spare fridge, which will still be usable. And then you just heat them up in your microwave in just two minutes. And they're fresh, never frozen. These meals are delicious and you get all kinds of fun flavors and, and just meals like meals in general to choose from. Oh, so great. And that means we get to skip the extra trip to the grocery store and also skip the chopping, the prepping and the cleaning up too, which can be really important. Not just if you're having your kitchen redone like we are, but you know, if you're on your way, like I got five gigs this weekend, I'm going to need to know that I can come home in the middle, eat, fuel up and go. And factor is going to allow me to do that. It's so great. You got to check this out. I think you're going to love it. Head to factormeals.com slash giggab50 and use code giggab50 to get 50% off. So that's code G-I-G-G-A-B-5-0 at factormeals.com slash G-I-G-G-A-B-5-0. So factormeals.com slash giggab50 to get 50% off. And our thanks to Factor for sponsoring this episode. So like... Have you ever played music out? Have have you have you gigged before? Well, so when I was in that elementary school band, we did play a gig in a mall. <laughs> okay, hey, that counts, counts, man. Yeah, our twenty-some piece band, and um, there are people who listen to this show who may have never played in a twenty-piece band and 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 play out all the time. So that's like there you go. Yeah. I mean, it was an elementary school band. I it understand. was pretty awful, but... Yeah, but it was a seventh grade. That's a middle school band to people in the United yeah, States. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, no, it's it's just not something I've done because I haven't grown up really with musical friends. And, Interesting. Um, there's sort of a weird arc in my music story, which is I was more of an electronic music person. I had gone down the path of um, the mod scene and doing a bit more of that, um, you know, like the scream tracker and XM files and all that kind of stuff. And had got to a point where while I was in high school, I was working with a a record company. And I, and I remember being at the record company, going to visit after, I mean, after me and sort of my group had put together this demo CD that we sent around, they called us in to work with them and, of the members, I was the only one who sort of was able to participate. I had gone to the studio and um, they would give me jazz. Dri- I would bring my jazz discs, you know, the, the I Omega jazz one oh, gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this is it. Right. This is like, like, yeah, yeah portable hard drives for those yes, who don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, I would take a jazz drive in 
and we would load raw vocals uh, for tracks that they were working on. And basically he said, you know, bring these home, go ham, write remixes or ideas and stuff like that. Wow. And so I did a lot of that in sort of my high school years. But it was sort of at the time where I was, you know, it was time to be serious about, you know, post-secondary education. I was obviously a very computer oriented person. I did tons of software development starting in elementary school. Um, so I knew that that was sort of the, the direction I, I definitely wanted to go down and I always wanted to smash music and computer. So I had to focus more on the computer side, more on the school side. I brought my keyboard with me, uh, to school, but you know, it just, it sucked up all my time. And, you know, I did my internships while I was in school. So I was you know, I did some time at ATI. Remember ATI? Oh yeah, oh, yeah for sure. <laughs> I did time at ATI. I actually got a job at B. Um, uh, so I worked with them for a couple Louis. of terms. Yes, yes. Right. Um, which was fantastic. He would eat lunch with us. He was wow. such a character. Oh, he was great. Um, is great. Um, and uh, yeah, just, you know, music kind of sat to the side and I didn't hang out with people who were musical. I like. I didn't have that experience of, you know, people in the dorms having guitars in their dorm room. I, I, I don't think I, I knew a single person with an instrument in their dorm room other than me. That's and, fascinating. So, yeah. So this was really just happenstance that, that, that did not pull you into a uh, group playing scenario later in life. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, you know, now my only option is sort of the cliche dad band, right? <laughs> And the guy's there's, getting there's hammered nothing, in the basement. <laughs> well, yeah, there's nothing wrong with a dad band. It, there are habits that some dad bands pick up that aren't maybe the, the, the most productive musically, but if they're having fun, it's fine. They're safe in the basement. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking the ones who aren't good enough to be in front of other people right. because it's, it's basically instrument karaoke in someone's basement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but that's but like, yeah, you're right. That, 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 and that happens. And sometimes those bands do take their, their show to the stage and, and it shows, uh, but there's nothing wrong with having fun in the basement, playing music I, to, at the same degree. I loved when rock band first came out that the, the game, not, not rock mm -hmm. bands. I mean, I loved when rock bands came out, but I wasn't around then. I, I hadn't yet been born, but like the, the game rock band allowed people to, like you said, play sort of karaoke with instruments ish. Uh, but interacting with music in a much deeper way than simply listening to it. And it's something that, that all of us as musicians get to do. And it was, I found it fascinating to be able to do this with my family, especially with, you know, my wife who at least at the time had not really ever played an instrument. And she's like, this is so much fun. I'm like, yeah, I know. Like <laughs> <laughs> you could, you could make the argument that, you know, we talk about how, so much of the live music, certainly in our audience, are still playing, you know, 40, 50 year old classic rock songs, right? right? You could make the argument that what you've done and certainly, you know, video lessons on YouTube has enabled people to pick up analog instruments, you know, in a world that has become increasingly produced in digital, you know, musicality, musical production. It's really like, you know, whether you're in a garage, whether you're in the, in the basement, whatever it is getting the guitar into, into a kid's hand at some point in time. I mean, you know, we, we go deeper into whether, you know, kids aren't learning to read music as much anymore. And certainly, you know, popular music kids aren't are learning to read music as much anymore. This is, you're helping someone find a path to creating an art. And for every, you know, a hundred dad bands you might be empowering, if there's one kid who might not have picked up the guitar, if he didn't hear something and didn't know where to go, how to figure it out. I mean, we get a little existential here. It's quite a service to the world, right? Yeah. And even yeah. the service to dad bands. Like I like like I, <laughs> I don't want to be dismissive of this because I know no, I know we have a lot of people listening that are in dad bands. And it like it's a great thing. If you're having fun playing music, great. And and then of course, and you know, we've got eight plus years of episodes about what to do and how to take yourself from that to something that you know you're gonna want to put on stage over and over again. That, that's also great. But if you just want to stay in the basement, capo's also for you, but music is also for you. It's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like to think of the whole 
the exercise of, of, you know, picking up your instrument and, and trying to tackle something that speaks to you, you know, like just something that catches you. It's, it's really hard to put into words. Something just kind of buries itself in your head and you're like, like, what the hell were they playing? Like, how did they make that cool sound or whatever? And, and just sort of, it's almost like a heightened imp- uh, music appreciation, right? You're, you're not just listening to the song anymore. You're, you're trying to get into that artist's head a little bit. Like, you know, where were they on the fretboard or like, you know, how the heck did they coordinate the, the kick and the tom in that weird, interesting way? And, and just trying to put yourself into that, you know, uh, one of our early taglines for Capo was reverse engineering rock and roll. Ooh, and yeah. That, that works. That works for oh, pro- yeah. yeah. It works for nerd programmer nerds. Yes, yes, yes. but not exactly. so much for. That's people why it's who not really. Know. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it but it 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 totally captures what it is that you do with Capo, yeah. right? You're you're trying to almost like back solve for how did those sounds, you know, how did how did that make any sense? Um, and now, Chris, when you um, when you launch Capo. Do you, it's kind of a security question, sort of, but it's not really what I'm getting at. Do you know what songs people are are loading into Capo? Does this ever come back to you? Do you can you create a only Capo in support? Of, only, only in support. Only if they tell you. Only if they tell me. Um, I will neither confirm nor deny whether people actually <laughs> send me tracks that give them trouble just so I can, you know, figure out the cause of, of a yeah. specific issue. But um yeah, people will tell me all the time, you know, just, you know, even just in thanks, like, oh, I, I picked up the Stevie Ray Vaughan thing that I had been, you know, trying to tackle for 20 years. And I just, you know, never came across something that even gave me a fighting chance of it. In some cases, it's just somebody who's reached uh, an age where they have the time to put into this instrument that sure. they had to put down for some reason. And they just love the fact that they sort of get this renewed sense of of energy around, like, I've got this new toy that it's not just a toy. It's actually allowing me to spend time on the thing that's important to spend time on, which is playing the instrument, not just right, right, right. acquiring more gear and piling it up. In the <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. Wrong with that. <laughs> hey, if, if I were to tilt my camera over to, to the side, you guys would see <laughs> All a, of us. a nightmare of, you know, rack equipment and, um, you know, piled up hey, drums. One man's and... nightmare is another man's <laughs> heaven, right? Oh, absolutely. 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 It, it would actually be super interesting to know the weekly Capo top 10 songs that are being fed into Capo for learning that that would be amusing. Absolutely. And you know what? Um, on that on that note, that is something that I. I don't do, but I don't do it intentionally because I'm very much nervous about things related to privacy long before sure. Apple sure. made it a a an important part of keynotes, but long ago, (laughs) you know, we had things with the sparkle automatic updating things. And one of the things was, you know, Hey, you can include a, an anonymous, you know, system configuration or something along those lines. And that even gave me a little bit like weirded out. Like now people are, we're getting their IP addresses when they're checking for updates and you can figure out their location and you, they're telling us now what computers and operating system version they're on. And like, I get that, it's it's important to sort of get that information and act on that information. But at the same time, how you go about collecting that information shouldn't be so, you know, willy nilly thrown about like sure. in the developer world. I, that just super responsible. Yeah. It, it's a pipe dream that I would just throw out there, but it totally makes sense. Oh yeah. yeah the, what you do. the curiosity of it would be great to know the, the collecting Absolutely that information. Price for that curi- yeah. It's a slippery slope, right? Yeah. 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 Chris, what about um, like the rise in all these new um, online AI tools that let you drop out certain tracks? And, you know, it seems like there's sort of a, a merging of thoughts there between what you do and what they do. There's two ones that guys and bands that I play with were like, one's called Moses.ai. Davey shared with me a different one, right? It seems like, you know, in terms of that overall framing of deconstructing stuff, mm-hmm. that's kind of in your sandbox, isn't it? It is and it isn't. So there's something really tricky going on there. And I don't want to go too deep into this rant, but I'm a one person company that doesn't have VC money to uh, protect me from certain issues that are very delicate. So 
if I build an application that allows somebody to take their copyrighted recording and upload it to my company's server mm. and the control of my company, I'm now in possession of copyrighted material that I didn't pay for. And then now to further process that material and you know, you're infringing copyright again by making a derivative work, right? Uh, you right. know, even I, I've, I've spoken to a lawyer in the past who sort of lives in this world. And he said, even like generating a waveform is a derivative work of a copyrighted technically piece of material. Yeah. Yeah. And so capo is an on device processing first application. And so, you know, I try to work within those, those boundaries as much as possible where you know, all those quote infringements are happening within a user's device, all under the umbrella of fair use. Right. So the, the assumption is you bought the song, ripped the song, you own yes, the song. Exactly. It's on your computer. You know, it, it should as, as much as the definition of all good could be in this realm, that's as right. all good as things can be. I mean, once you start turning around and you, you know, uh, generate a chart from that and then uh, format it and sell it online. Well, now you're, I mean, yeah, you're now going outside the realm of, <laughs> you know, yeah. now you're breaking the law uh, more yeah. wantonly. So going back to the sort of the AI source separation stuff, the difficulty there is in some cases they're using pre-trained models and we don't know what those pre-trained models were trained on. And we don't know what the provenance of those training materials were. Um, so I don't know how long for the world those technologies are in, in those cases. In the other cases where they're actually training um, the models themselves, um, that's just something I, the lack of the, the VC money or just a really friendly, you know, major label to provide me with stems to do the training, because that's effectively how the training works is you have a fully mixed songs here and here are all the stems of that recording. And now you train to learn how to turn that mixed song into those stems. And so you need an awful lot of songs and an awful lot of those stems in order to do a sufficient amount of training. So when you're like the Sony's of the world and, and Sony has a, a whole lab working on this AI demixing technology because they have big they time have, commercial they have reasons all the tracks to do too. that. Yeah, yeah. They do. And so they have legitimate business reasons why they want to do this. You know, they uh, have older recordings that, you know, for some reason they may need to adjust in, in an actual professional studio format. So they're absolutely trying to, to build this technology so that they could leverage their, you know, catalog, so to speak. Um, so obviously they're going to have a massive catalog that they can access to train uh, their materials. I want to, I want to stop right there because I, I, yeah. I, I, I just want to shine a light on your excellent it's sort of almost accidental description of how AI training works. The three of us here are kind of nerdy at, at different degrees and, and this is understood, but for folks listening, this may be the first time some of you have heard a, it, it heard it described how AIs, uh, the, the, especially the models that we're talking about today and calling AI today are trained. It's lots of data and lots of patterns thrown at, at computers that then sort of process those and learn how to take an, one thing that you've been given an example of, or lots of examples of, and turn it into something else that you've been given examples of, or recognizing things, pattern matching, pattern recognition. This all falls under the umbrella of, of what's called machine learning in, in the, the, the programmer nerdy world. But you, the way you described it of saying, taking a mixed song and, showing it the mix song and then showing it the stems that made that mix song. You do that enough and it starts to be able to find the patterns of, Oh, okay. I see how to break this apart. So I, I, I just wanted to rehash that for, you know, 30 seconds here because Absolutely, I, yeah. I think people, Useful. people might really get utility out of at least understanding how this stuff works, not just with music, but everything that we're hearing about with AI today. So thank you for indulging me. No problem. Um, so there's another um, similar issue with uh, chord recognition that shows up in other apps because I am like convinced nobody has done their chord recognition training the way that I've done it, which is to say that in the research community a long time ago, 
a whole bunch of material was collected in a method that nobody's really sure about. So there's a whole bunch of, you know, recordings sort of floating around the research community, sort of guarded by universities to, you know, produce these trained machine learning models. So the models are sort of questionable, mm. but also the training data is somewhat questionable. So if somebody gets a hold of that data set and tries to train the stuff themselves on the audio part of the data set, they're really sort of in, in a very dangerous spot. At the end of the day, are, is anybody going to get caught and get in trouble? Probably not because, you know, people get away with stuff all the time. Like look at Uber, right? Like Uber just muscles in and says, who cares about taxi laws and all this other <laughs> stuff? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's the same idea um, sort of happening here. But at the same time, I have a house, I have a family. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to jeopardize yeah, you want my to entire avoid, well-being. You want to avoid the distraction of a lawsuit. Uh, it, even right. if that's the worst that it would be, th th you still want to avoid it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So effectively, all I had um, in a chord recognition engine, you basically want to line up some known chord labels. So like, you know, C sharp to, you know, B, whatever. Um, those are sort of like time stamped, almost like markers placed along uh, a timeline. And you need to match that with the audio that it belongs to. And then the, you train the, the neural network to sort of learn that, you know, this chunk of sound over here is the F sharp and this chunk of sound over here is this. I'm greatly simplifying it, but that's the, the, the gist of it. So if you don't have the audio and you just have those labels of, you know, where the chords are in time, you now have to supply the audio. Well, how do you supply the audio? Well, me and my wife go on a purchasing spree to <laughs> purchase all of the music that belongs to oh, the labels in, in the sort of well-known training data sets. Try to find as many of those songs as humanly possible um, in various sources and legitimately purchase them. But now I have to hand align the labels to that audio because when somebody rips a CD you know, in, in, in Europe, they have a different CD that has different time gaps in between right, right. the songs. And so if that label belongs to that rip, my rip is going to be adjusted by say 200 milliseconds or, or worse sometimes. So you had to hand adjust all these things just to train capo yes. to then be able to do what it does for us when we feed it our own stuff. Yeah, I mean, this took me like two and a half plus years. I was just going to say, how many everything. years did you spend doing this? That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, it's, this is why I, it can do what it does, though, folks, because yeah. like you spent it, not just the time programming it to be able to do it, but then training it yourself. Like you didn't you don't have a team of minions out of view. You have lots of music gear out of view. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could I have mean, spent I, that money on a team of minions, Chris. I just want <laughs> to Unfortunately, it's hard to find said minions that yes. are, are yes. musically inclined to pull off that kind of work. It's, fair, fair. Yeah, it's yeah. tricky. Like better, even, to have, better to have the instruments. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it was a lot of work. Um, I built even a custom training environment because you, there's no off-the-shelf chord recognition training software. You know, like yeah. there was just a ton of software that is not part of capo that was written in order to build what's in capo. And, you know, I'm very proud of it. The results are insane. I mean, I've, I've actually had sort of industry people um, who had been evaluating other technologies for sort of large scale transcription projects. And they were like, yeah, we downloaded, you know, X, Y, and Z. I'm not going to name names, but we downloaded all these other pieces of software and they're like, barely getting like 40 to 65 percent in, in a lot of the songs that we're feeding it and just as a last ditch thing because we had only just heard of capo i i sort of forwarded a copy of capo to some of my colleagues and they load they load the songs into capo and and they're like holy crap this thing's hitting like 73 75 percent accuracy sometimes you know in the high 90s um and they were blown away they were like, and you, you do this by yourself in your basement? Like we're talking like VC funded PhD yeah. holding crazy people who are building these other technologies. But yeah, you, and like you took a real 
a, a significant risk investing not just your money, but your time into mm. this when like right now, correct me if I'm wrong, please. But for super mega ultra groovy, which I, I love the name. So I say it a lot, but it is your company. It, it's you and your yeah, wife. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So like you have one app, right. That you sell right actively. now. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, we You've had, had others. Peak. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. No. I mean, so, I, I, so that's, I mean, that's a risk. I, obviously it has absolutely. paid off and it's, it's wonderful, but like, this is what it takes. I, you know, I do, I do a show cause I'm obsessed with like small business and, and that. So I do a show called business brain too, which we've done a crossover here because musicians often find themselves as entrepreneurs almost accidentally mm -hmm. at times it happens to programmers too. It turns out. Um, and when you're a programmer musician, you're sort of destined for it. But like, th this is, this is impressive, man. Like it's really something. Yeah. You, yeah, you took a risk I mean, to get here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, it's a rough road. Um, it's, it's really challenging. I'd say that, you know, success isn't, uh, it's, it's not as successful as I would have hoped at this point. Um, and a lot of the challenges I face right now are with, with respect to streaming services. Mm -hmm. Um, that material is completely off limits. Any any apps that sort of use, um, the, I mean, one of them in particular, Spotify, there was sort of a well-known thing that happened fairly recently where all the apps that did support Spotify, note that Capo never supported Spotify because I took one look at the terms of service and I said, oh, they don't let you do this kind of thing. And yet all these software packages are coming out that are doing exactly mm. the thing they shouldn't be doing with the Spotify API. And they finally dropped the hammer, I want to say, three, four years ago. And all of those apps lost that functionality. And the user base just went bananas, obviously, because something that they paid for now doesn't work the way that it used to. Yep. Um, but at the same time, I'm fighting this idea that, hey, I pay X dollars a month to Apple Music. I, quote, own the songs. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to convince people that, hey, you know, you actually got to buy the, the individual track in order to load it into Capo because I need to see all the samples and do all the analysis and all that stuff. Um, and digital rights management is what it is. And iTunes will still sell you a DRM free copy of the song. Yes. And it's a couple of taps in Capo to sort of get you from that Apple Music copy to, to the one that you own. Amazing. And you load it in and it just works. I use Capo largely. Um, I listen to a lot of live music, bootleg mm -hmm. stuff and stuff like that. And, yes. you know, so there's like one cool solo that I want to learn here. One cool, and that, that stuff blows my mind. But w what would the problem be with the model? Because there are several very good um, online and on-device mm -hmm. tools that you can buy tab for, right? So why not, if you're already going out and buying all this music and you're basically you know, running it through Capo for your own purposes, you know, why not create a library of Capo ready songs and, you know, let someone warrant you that they do own a legal copy of it. And then they can, the same thing as buying a tab, you know, there's, there's a program called guitar pro, for example, right? Sure. You, people tab, you know, in amazing detail out a lot of this type of stuff. You can't, you know, do a lot of things you can do with Capo, but what, what would the argument against, um, against just creating a Capo library and, and letting people purchase Capo ready to, ready uh, files i will answer your question with another question mm -hmm. why don't kids in schools just read the coles notes <laughs> right <laughs> i mean <clears throat> there's something to be said for for the learning that happens when you when you sort of what's a, what's a good word for it but you like when immerse you immerse yourself in it no i want to say you, you have to sort of get your lumps right like you have to mm -hmm. you have to fail a little bit and you have to have a little bit of that struggle because that's kind of where the magic happens and, you know, the neuron connections and stuff in our brains, right? I have personally found that I have, it's not like I don't use tabs. I go online and find tabs once in a while. I haven't in a long time, but I've definitely done it in the life since Capo was out there just to sort of pick up a, a few, you know, more finger picking type stuff. And I can tell you that the songs that I spent time learning in Capo myself by ear very slowly i know them a hundred times better and i also kind of i'm a little bit more proud of those songs in my repertoire because of you know the time that went into it 
I don't know if that makes me a weird person or, or whatever, but I feel like there's so much value in that extra work. Just like how people say that, you know, if you actually write with a pencil or a pen and paper to sort of take notes, yeah, you're better of off than typing yeah. those notes because there's something about that brain muscle connection that when you're engaging it and you're working slowly and thinking more slowly, you are you are learning way more effectively. Oh, yeah. Super interesting well, it's like, answer. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, when we were kids, the way we got a copy of the lyrics for a song was to listen to the song kind of like capo would have been a great tool for this because yeah. you would listen to sections over and over again and scribble it down. And then you'd talk about it with your friends and be like, no, I think they're saying this here, or that here. And the songs that I did that with, I will never forget those lyrics. Exactly. And, exactly. and yet the ones I download from the internet, I will never learn those lyrics. Right. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a weird phenomenon, but it's the and, human and brain. Here, it's weird. Yeah. But we and talk about this on the show all the time about, about how to, how to learn stuff, right. As musicians, you know, it's yeah. to learn stuff in a shorter period of time. But this is, the, this is a super refreshing reminder that in a, in our culture where we want to just get things done fast, sometimes we're actually hurting our capabilities to, you know, to learn more. Well, where you said, you said the magic happens when you fail and I'm paraphrasing, but I, I love it. So it's true, but like you, you articulated it perfectly. Yes. (laughs) Great t-shirt. It it helps that I've been, uh, that I've been sort of researching this field a little bit lately. Um, but (laughs) Um, I thought you were going to say it helps that you failed a lot and (laughs) that you're the most magical person we would ever know. (laughs) Well, I'm sort of taking a weird life turn where, um, I've, I've gotten back to school. I'm, 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 I'm in grad school right now, sort of simultaneously on top of everything else and actually doing research into learning by ear, um, and sort of the whole process of it and how people do it, uh, what's most effective, um, you know, strategies techniques that people what field seem is to that? use uh, well it's I'm, I'm doing it with a with a um sort of a, an hci human computer interaction lens so it's in computer science but it's more the 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 interaction uh side of it where you, you think about you know how he, humans interact with computers and you know uh, uh the efficiencies that could be had or not be had or you know like some technologies may not be helpful. Some technologies may actually, like I said, you know, typing sort of makes it worse, right? Uh, compared to writing by hand. Um, you know, that I, I think there's some stuff going on there. Research has already been done sort of down that field already. Um, and it's so fascinating. Like there's fascinating. like some of the earliest research is a book written in 1980 called How to, How to Become a Rock Musician, I think is the title. By Dave a guy, in, oh, you've read that. Dave wrote that. Oh, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> and and so that that's a fascinating book because it's this guy. His name is H. Stith Bennett, and he embedded himself in the local music scene in Denver. And what he did was he responded to ads from bands looking for bandmates and he would join these bands, but he would sort of join in more of a managerial role or, or something low level, like something that didn't require such high musical skill, but he would get into these bands, be totally open about the fact that, you know, he's kind of studying what's going on and all this stuff. And he is fascinated to find out that these people are all learning straight off of the radio or off of records or cassettes or whatever. And, and then he goes on to talk about how this is basically the, noca- the notation of rock music. It's not written down. It's, it's mm-hmm. all in recordings. And even when there is notation, like tablature or whatever, that was obtained by ear. Yeah. Like this stuff was not like, you know, the stories the, you hear. The artists Beethoven didn't deliver it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like they yeah. didn't just sit down and have it in their head and write it down on, on staff paper and, and then perform it. It was like brought into existence audibly captured on recordings and sort of passed down that way or, you know, face to face or whatever. However, sure. Yeah. But it's, but it's like this sort of oral tradition that's been passed down. And um, even though we have these technologies and we have notation and stuff like that, and there's obviously 
much value to that. Then uh, I think there's another quote from this book that says something along the lines of, you know, a sheet of notes, you'd be hard pressed to call that music. Even though we call it music, looking at a sheet of paper is not music. It has to be, you know, brought to life with sound to become music. And that's kind of, um, it's a beautiful thought when you think about it, but it's so true that even the classical music, there's, there's like a world of different ways you could play things. You could play things more rubato and more expressively, or you could play things, you know, very rigidly and staccato. And they're two different performances of the same piece, yet they both have their same character. And if, and to some well, people, I think you're saying, I think yeah. you're saying is that if, if, if Eric Clapton, Eric Clapton is on become Eric Clapton listening to Robert Johnson, yeah. if he has tablature, right? There's something Absolutely. that happens in the translation of what he heard and felt and mm -hmm. learned through an audible source into him creating his own art. That is, would it, some of the, some of the absolute finite tools that, that we have available today are in, impediments to getting to that, that type of art creation. Absolutely. I mean, um, it's interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting how these artists quote, write music without writing anything at all. Right. Mm. You're, you're taking the, the decades of, you know, licks and, and riffs and, you know, ideas and shapes on the neck and, and tonal things that you can do. And that amalgamation of, of, you know, your, your history as a musician then breeds completely new stuff and sure. you generate new material and you quote, write your entire songs based on things that you're sort of regurgitating out of nowhere uh, in your own special way and breathing, you know, new life into these sort of quote, old ideas and doing something completely different with them. Well, it's kind of, it's kind of like the magic is in the gray, right? If, if you yes. know it's the 10th fret on the, on the fifth string, you're going to just play that. But yep. if you heard it and there's a little bit of a bend to it, or if you heard it, and there's like, right. Yep. Or, or you just hear it a little bit differently and you're searching for that in that mm -hmm. is where the new art is, is born. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. It's, it's, I think it's a great world that we sort of live in. You know, we, we get to, uh, yeah. we have the unique experience that separates the musicians from, you know, the rest of the people, which is sort of our unique ability to, to get something else from what we hear that other people don't get, which is that we sort of have it in the back of our mind. Like, how would I produce that same sound and, and actually have a chance of answering that question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This has Absolutely. been awesome, man. Chris, thank you for obviously for your sponsorship of the show for so long, but really for just taking your time and, I uh, like what, what a blast to be able to get nerdy Great conversation. Like this. Yeah, man, we could no problem. <laughs> well, I want to have you back on at some point, especially a, a, as your head dives deeper into this world that you're, that you're heading in with your studies, with your current studies. Um, I like, I, I don't know, like this is, I love this stuff. This is great. Yeah. And that's, and that's ultimately why I have just one product. I mean, I, I sort of, I clicked so hard with this. I mean, this has been my life. I didn't really see it as such an important part of my life, but you yeah. know, looking back now at this age, I see that, Hey, not only am I a musician, but I am a by ear musician. That's just who I am. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I never really saw it that way before, but damn it. That's me. And I'm proud. Damn it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's great. Yeah, there, right. There's nothing. I, there, there's so many right ways of being a musician. And and step number one is enjoy what you're doing. I oh, I, yeah. I think, I, you know, that's yeah. and and that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It means different things to individuals. Uh, you know, enjoying music comes for me in many different forms at different times and in different scenarios. So, yeah, there's there's, there's I don't know. I guess I there are you, wrong ways, but, but this ain't one of them. So yeah, this ain't one of them. Yeah. yeah I, I would say it, Chris, you kind of unwittingly, but maybe wittingly gave people a new perspective on, on learning by ear and enjoying the path of learning by ear about all that it can pay back for you. So maybe, maybe that elevator pitch you gave in the beginning, maybe, maybe we can polish it up a little bit and, you know, discover the joy of, of music by ear. Right. So for good sure for you. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for all you do, man. Yeah. Thanks for continued support. And yeah, man. 
you know it's a it's a non-zero sum game we all we all benefit here yeah. this is this is awesome so chris before we leave uh tell people where to find you please um you'll find uh super mega ultra groovy at super mega ultra groovy.com that's kind of a mouthful you can also sort of shortcut it by going to capoapp.com, C-A-P-O-A-P-P.com. Um, searching for Capo, C-A-P-O on the App Store should bring up Capo. Okay. <laughs> I, I say should because the App Store, you know, is, uh, is sort of, um, uh, it's a little bit of a mixed bag sometimes. Sure. But, so lately it's been, it's been good to me. It, it's it's probably very good to most of our listeners and they have no idea about the mixed bag that is the app store. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for everything. This is, this is absolutely fantastic. We, um, we say a thing at the end of every episode. Do you, do you know what that thing is that we like to share with people, Chris? And if so, would you share it with everyone? I would. Uh, always be performing. That's good advice. I'm out of a job now. 